Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to In the Tradition, presented by the Atlanta Jazz Festival. My name is Ray Cornelius, and I'm the host of WCLK's Upfront Inside the Entertainment Industry. And it is truly my pleasure to be talking to the one of the newest and hottest jazz voices, Miss Jasmia Horn. Hi there. How are you? Hey. Hi, Ray. Thank you for having <laughs> me. I'm, I'm doing all right. Thank you. Absolutely. I was super, super excited uh, when they reached out to me and asked, hey, can you do this interview? And I was like, abso freaking lutely. Got a chance to uh, to meet you a couple of years back when you came and performed, I believe it was the 2019 Atlanta Jazz Festival. Yeah. And I was completely blown away by mm -hmm. your performance. And so mm -hmm. I, I said, yes, we got to do this interview. And this has been an amazing virtual series so far in the tradition has talked to, I would say, probably the biggest and brightest names in jazz music as we're gearing up for this year's Atlanta Jazz Festival as it returns this fall to historic Piedmont Park. And so we're super excited to uh, have you back in our city. I'm super excited to be there. I love Atlanta. I love Atlanta. <laughs> and I have to shout out my boy, Henry Connorway, who is part yeah. of your band, <laughs> who is also uh, has been a fixture in Atlanta's jazz scene for a number of years before he transitioned up to New York City. So got to give him a shout out as well. You have been I would say, oh my gosh, on just this roller coaster uh, of a career, two-time Grammy nominee, you just picked up your very first NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Jazz Album. Take us back to that night, because that happened earlier this year, and I think has really set the precedence for 2021. Would you agree? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In so many ways. Oh my goodness. That night was amazing. That night was like, it was like, oh, it was the closest thing I think that I'll ever experience to the land of milk and honey. You know what I mean? Just super black, super amazing. The music was popping. The celebrities were themselves and in their element and just free to be. It felt like a family reunion. I mean, really, um, there was like a barbecue quail. I don't eat meat, but like it reminded me of like something that my family would cook. They had a serious mean mac and cheese. Like, I mean, it was it was amazing. I was like, where am I? I, I want to go every year. I want to go every single year. Um so that was a moment that I'll never forget. And also just to like have the opportunity to be recognized by my people on a grand level means so much more to me than anything. You know what I mean? Um, the Grammy nominations are amazing, but I know there are some people who are not in my shoes, you know, who, who, who may be walking kind of similarly in the same path who don't have the type of respect for me that my people have for me. Um, as African Americans, as indigenous people to this planet and to this earth and to this to America. So it just it was just a different experience. It was it was, I mean, really indescribable. I, I really can't think of like a a barbecue or like a a family reunion, you know, a house party, um, but in a very like I, I said, the land of milk and honey, like that's the closest thing, you know, that I could compare it to. And then getting up on that stage to receive the award and to see, uh, like, I'm not going to name all the celebrities. I was like, I was just, it was just a real, a real privilege. It really was, you know, um, so many activists were there just, it was just incredible. I just, I had an amazing time dancing, eating, laughing, talking, receiving an award, seeing people get their award. The, everything about that, everything about that experience was phenomenal. I, I have to say that. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, you know, you were talking about family. I want to take you back a little bit, your name, which is so unique. But when I was thinking about it this morning, as I was, as I was preparing uh, for this interview, when I think of a horn, um, mm -hmm. to me, it represents uh, or it symbolizes when something great is coming or when something great is being introduced or when something great is about to happen. I mean, even God says that we're going to leave this planet at the sound of a trumpet. And so when I thought of Jasmine Horn, 
Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, there's so much tied into that. And your name came from your grandmother. Can you talk about that that as well? Yes. So all all of my names, all three of my names, um, and my 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 middle name, I'm just recently getting getting into and really understanding. Um, so my grandmother Harriet Horn, um, or Harriet Curtis Horn, because she was a Curtis before she was married before she's married to my grandfather. So she was a pianist. She was an educator. You know, grandmother, mother, um, like she really didn't play. You know, she really didn't play. She stood firmly in what she believed in. And then she taught us those morals and values as well. Um, One of her daughters has eight sons. Another daughter has five sons or five children. And actually one of them passed recently. And, um, and then my, my other aunt has a daughter. She actually just passed last year during the, the peak of the pandemic. And then my father has two of us. So there's like 20 something of us, you know, and my grandmother can handle us all in one room. Nobody was going to act out. Nobody, you know, she was, she ran a tight ship. So when I was, before I was born, um, my mother and father were not married, but they were messing around. And and my family has a church called the mission, the golden chain missionary Baptist church. And that's where my mother and father, you know, grew up in church. Um, and they also went to the same high school. And so they loved each other very, very much. They loved, they were, they were each other's first love and they, they loved each other so much. Um, and so, when I, before I was consumed, my grandmother told my mother, you're going to have a child and her name is going to be Jasmia. And my mom laughed because she was like, hi, yeah, whatever. Um, and a couple of weeks later, she found out she was pregnant, <laughs> you know? And so my mom was like, I have to, I have to name her Jasmia because that's, that's what, you know, that's what granny told me. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and so, so it, that happened. She wanted to name me I don't remember something that I'm glad, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that she didn't name me what she was going to name me. Um, but she still had a name that she wanted to give me and it was, it was Janae. Um, and so I recently found out that in Hebrew, Yane, which is the same as Janae, um, my middle name is spelled J A H N E A. If you take off the J because there is no J in Hebrew and you put a Y, it means Yah shows grace or Yah shows favor. Um, Yah mean, meaning Yahweh, the most high, shows favor. And then horn, like you said, kind of like a chauffeur, the sounding of the trumpets. Um, I just think that that's beautiful. And I'm, I'm thankful. I have not always liked my name. In fact, when I was a little girl, I hated my name because I didn't know anything about jazz music. I actually hated it. You know, people would call me jazzy. It's like, no, I'm not jazz ish or jazz Z. I'm jazz Mia. Don't ish me. Don't, you know, don't do that. Um, so, and then when I got older, it was really difficult for me to get a job. You know what I mean? Like they see jazz Mia on an application. There's no way I'm getting hired. And that was really a tragedy for me. Um, until I really started walking in my purpose until I really, you know, owned my craft as a musician, as Jazz Mia Horn. But before then, I, you know, I had a, I had a hard time living with my name. And like most artists, I think the legend is always, you know, you got your start in the church. Yes. You started singing in the church and you also attended Booker T. Washington High School, which is also the home to Nora Jones, uh, Roy Hargrove and Erica Badu, who are all, I think, um, big names in terms of jazz music and and and, and soul music. So talk a little bit about coming from that lineage of great artists and coming out of that high school and what you learned. And when did you decide that jazz was going to be your path? Um, when I, before I went to that school, I was actually, so half of my high school career, I went to a performing arts school, but the first half I went to a public school. Um, and just, I had really bad experiences there. You know, I was like one of the people um, who was, you know, just outspoken and outgoing. I was part of an emo band there, didn't know anything about jazz, you know. Um, I was listening to songs and and had a band that was very much like um a Nirvana or a corn or a kill switch engage or um the black parade, you know, like these different um punk emo bands. And I was I was involved in that heavily. And I took I really understood what it was like to be a musician. You know, that was like the first time that I understood what it was like to be a musician because we would have practice every day in our garage, you know? So that was the first time that I got my discipline for 
music, but also when I was there, um, I was in the JROTC. And I did that for four years, actually, um, junior high and, and in high school, because I I thought I was going to go into the army. I didn't think that I was going to be a musician by the time I got to junior high school. Um, and then I kept auditioning for Brick and T. Washington. My mom didn't want me to go. She just kept saying, you don't need to be a musician. It didn't work for me. You know, it didn't your father it didn't work for your father. So just, you know, do something else with your life. And I was like, my, I, I just want to sing. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to sing. Um, and so I had an aunt. Her name is Tracy. Thank you, Aunt Tracy. She took me to Booker T. Washington um, audition without telling my mom. <laughs> we snuck to an audition. She prepared me. You know, she explained to me arias and sight reading and sight singing, all of these things that I knew nothing about. Um, Southern Baptist Church didn't know anything about ear training or theory. And she taught me a little bit about it so that I would be a, at least a little prepared and know a little bit of something when I went to my audition. And so those first two auditions, those first two auditions, I didn't make it. By the time that that third audition came around, I got in. And when we told my mom, she was devastated. <laughs> my mom was devastated. But when I got there, there was so much that was so inspiring for me because I was seeing people who were 14 and 15 and 16 writing their own compositions, understanding theory, practicing the importance of having that discipline to go and actually practice and put time in and effort into their music, um, auditioning for IAJE, which doesn't exist anymore, um, really going into like the Thelonious Monk Institute or the Thelonious Monk competition, auditioning for that or the Saravant. All of this stuff I had no access to in the urban neighborhood that I grew up in. So going downtown to the arts district in Dallas and really having that opportunity to understand what it's like to be a musician, that really helped me to develop my career in such a different way. And all things that were not related to music or being a musician were pushed off to the side. I had bought myself a plethora of CDs. I did more chores so I can buy some CDs because, you know, there was not a lot of iTunes and Spotify and all that didn't exist at the time. So, you know, I was taking my cassette tapes and practicing and hearing different Sarah Vaughn solos and Betty Carter and whoever else. And I was like trying to transcribe as much as I could to kind of get that sound in my belly and get it in my soul um, so that I could actually really be able to speak it. You know, you have to learn the language and all of that really helped me. I had a teacher named Roger Boykin and he had given me a CD, a compilation CD with all these different singers. And I learned, it was about 30 songs on that CD. And I learned every single one, note for note, phrase for phrase, breath for breath. And that was the beginning of jazz for me. Wow. And I have to say, I mean, to see you, to have seen you perform live, um, again, as I was doing my research, I was like, it's almost like seeing Beyonce. And I don't know if you've ever seen Beyonce. It's like an experience. It's not, you don't just give a concert. You give an experience. For someone that is there, it's like, this is a moment. Like, this is more than just someone getting on stage and showing us that they can sing and that they, you know, know, know jazz music and things. You give an experience. And you walk away from that, like, what did I just, what was that? <laughs> what did I just encounter? That is what I felt when I saw you perform at the Jazz Festival. And then just looking at um, YouTube videos of you performing in various you know, venues around the country, I was like, she's on it. And she's on it in a way that is so refreshing for jazz music right now. And I think that is so, so important because I think right now we're at a, we're at a time where the generations are turning, the tides are turning, and the older generations are, are leaving and then we're ushering in what is new and what is current. Let's talk about those influences because you have been compared to the likes of Betty Carter with all the scatting and just the, the, the sass that she would bring. You mentioned Sarah Vaughn and then I saw the New York Times even compared you to Nancy Wilson. Mm -hmm. How, who were your influences in terms all of, of them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and let's talk about that. Um, well, I will start with the top three, Sarah Vaughn, Betty Carter and Rochelle Farrell. Okay. Those are my three angels. Those are my pillars of women that I have to always go back and revert to. There's so much of their music, their live performances, their albums that I'm still listening to and still just kind of enthralled into. It's really, 
um, it never gets old to me. It never gets old. Every time I listen, I find something new that I hadn't heard before with those three, right? I really appreciate Betty Carter for her musicianship, but specifically the way she would write tunes, the way she would conduct her band. And the beautiful thing about um, her is that there are so many musicians on the scene today that I can call up right now and say, hey, what was it like? Mark Carey, Nate Smith, uh, Taurus Mateen, um, Cyrus Chestnut, the late, great Ralph Peterson. Um, I could just call them at any time and say, what was it like? You know, and um, I have this chart that I found of hers, you know, that I magically got through some person who knew somebody. Did you ever play this chart? What was it like? You know, these little things um, and just hearing the stories about her, her it really reminded me of my grandmother, like how my grandmother ran a tie ship and she didn't play, but how she also made sure to take care of her musicians and pay them well and feed them well and make sure they had what they needed. You know, and for me, that's important because there's there's a little bit of an interconnectedness between being a mother and being um, a musician, a band leader specifically, because if you think about Nina Simone, Betty Carter, uh, Abby Lincoln, all of these women made sure that they really took care of their musicians in a way, in, in a sense, like with the sensibility of how a mother takes care of her children. So being a mother has actually helped me a lot in my leadership as a band member and vice versa. You know, there's a certain way that you have to speak to your musicians, where there's a certain way you have to speak to your children when you want them to learn and you're educating them about the world. And it's the same exact way when you're educating your musicians about how you want them to play your music. Um, so that's kind of what I've learned from Miss Betty Carter. And then you go over to Rochelle Farrell, the instrument. <laughs> the instrument. Um, and then she does it so gracefully, you know, she makes, it's like so nonchalant. She sits and she plays and she, she sings and she opens her mouth and you're like, what is this? Who, what this goddess, you know, all of her essence. Um, I've just been inspired to be myself. You know, I was really afraid of my Southern accent when I moved to New York. I was really afraid of my, um, sometimes raspy timbre, sometimes belting timbre from church, sometimes um, light, sassy timbre like Sarah Vaughn. I was afraid of all of those nuances. And Rochelle taught me why. Why would you be afraid? Put all of that into your music. And I learned how to use my entire body just by watching her. Because when I'm talking and when I'm expressing myself to someone, it's it was different than how I used to perform. I would sit here with all this animated face and all of these expressions and tell you a story and really mean it and then get on the stage. And I couldn't apply that to my storytelling as an artist. And I said, why? And it was because of all the different ways that I was afraid. You know, I would see all of these other women get on the stage and just be cute with their little microphone and their cute little dresses and things and not necessarily be about the artistry and be about the music. And after watching her um, both live and, and you know, via, digi you know, digitally and seeing her express herself and watching her interviews, I said, I'm just going to be myself too. That really inspired me to bring something from within me out of me and allow that to be shared because people want to be related. They want to feel, you know, they want to relate to whatever it is that you're saying. If you can't relate to your audience, what is the purpose of you having one? You know, if you can't relate to people and not just for me, not just black people, but everybody who comes because everybody needs to see light. Everybody needs to have a good time. Everybody needs to be able to get through whatever they're going to. Everybody has their own circumstances, no matter what color, creed, race, sexual orientation. Everybody is somebody and everybody has their own purpose on the planet. And then I feel that it's my job to aid them in that. If it's just a song that's going to make them feel like, wow, that's going to help me get through the week. Or if it's the way that I dress while wow, she's being herself, she's carrying on her tradition, her African tradition with her origins, whatever that may be, however, the most high may use me. I want to do that. And that's what I saw in Miss Rochelle Farrell. And then with Sarah Vaughn, everybody told her, no, you know, it's the Jewish community that owns all of um, the, the jazz 
in the industry, meaning all of the catalogs, all of the record companies, most of the festivals, all of the managers, it's the Jewish community. And so all of those people told her, no, we don't want you in Carnegie Hall. You're not an opera singer. You're not a classical musician. And she said, I'm going to show y'all what this voice can do. I'm going to be rasped. I'm going to be have this raspy, brass-ish type of tone. And then I'm going to have these sweet and lilac embellishes that are just going to knock your socks off. And I'm going to do it being myself. I'm going to do it in jazz and I'm going to switch it up and be all of who I am in my music. And I'm going to scat and I'm going to sound great and I'm going to play my piano and my organ, you know? And she just, I, with her sassy self, I'm just like, wow, this is, you know, I really feel like these three women helps me to be myself. You know, you have to start somewhere. And without them, I don't think that I would be the musician that I am today without seeing and knowing what their stories are also. But knowing that how they had to survive and thrive as a black woman in the industry and what their experiences have been, but also how they got through it and how that um, came through their music, you know. I, I don't think I would be the vocalist that I am today because they, they were really pillars of, of my, my musical existence, so to speak. So those are my main three. There's so many others, but those are my, my angels. Wow. And I have to say, I mean, watching Rachel for, I've seen her a, a, a couple of times and you're right. It's almost like, again, you're having an experience and I, you know, you, you go to concerts, but then, I feel like sometimes you go to experiences and she is definitely one of them. You touched on style. And I think that was one of the first things that when your name was floating around, you know, hearing things, you know, well, who are you playing on, you know, on WCLK or who is that? You know, and when I saw your image, your, your, your pictures, I was like, oh, she's coming with some style that I haven't seen in a very long time. So who influenced that? Because that to me is so important to the overall packaging of an artist. And I think it's very important even with jazz artists because a lot of times when, when people think of jazz, they don't necessarily think of these over-the-top styles or, or this or that, but you came with something that was just totally different and very refreshing for jazz music. Thank you. Um, my grandmother inspired me. First lady coming in there with all kinds of hats, nails looking all good all kinds of bejeweled shoes and clutches and bags and things that lady didn't play and she could shop i remember being five and six years old we wake up early saturday morning and go to the the finest of the shops and stores these little crooks and nannies of stores that you don't even know exist you know not not the neiman marcuses and the coaches and the, all that it would be like these black women who design their own clothing or make their own clothing and they have their own st their own shops. They've come from Harlem. They've come from Atlanta. They've come from different places and they set up shop in Dallas and, and all of these women would support each other. So I grew up seeing that at an early age. Um, and then she, the way she dressed us, some days, you know, she would tell us what to wear and dress us and put us, you know, all those the blue bonnet socks with the little bells around them. And, oh, I was so tired of that. <laughs> but once I got older, um, you know, James Brown always said, they see you before they hear you. And that's true. Ladies and gentlemen, jazz me a horn. Ha! Ah! Ooh, what is she wearing? Before I even open my mouth, you know. Um, and so I really, for me, I really wanted to show people my culture, and, and to show my brothers and sisters that we don't have to be afraid to dress how we want to dress. You know, I'm wearing a chi pao right now. This is from China, but I've designed it with some little fringes and stuff on the, on the, on the seams on the side with some nice little pants and stuff like my own spin on some, something else. So I think that it's, it's important to not be afraid of culture and, um, you know, that's kind of been the case. You know, you see people in daishikis every now and then, or you may see them wearing some Ankara fabric every now and then. But what I did is because I'm I'm American, I'm Indigenous American, I was born here, 
but I'm also African-American because of my ancestry. So I just like to combine the two. You may see me in Ankara fabric, but most of the women who wear Ankara fabric, they're Muslim. So their whole entire bodies have to be covered because of their spiritual or their religious views. For me, I'm African-American. So I'm going to wear some bell bottoms and, you know, I'm going to have my little whatever things that I feel that I need to have that make me comfortable when I'm walking out and presenting myself my branding, my artistry, um, you know, so that's important. I feel like branding is important, you know, and I, I wanted to be able to share that and and share like, hey, we don't have to be afraid of our culture. You know, when you go into the workplace, you can design things that that fit into the workplace, but also fit into your culture. You don't have to always wear a suit, wear a tie that's ankara, have those border lines, have some fringes or some ankara or something on it, or, you know, whatever you feel that works for you. Um, and so I just wanted to to share that and, you know, hopefully that inspires someone else as well. Absolutely. I want to get into the music and I, I heard, I was, as I was saying earlier, I was doing my research. I heard we have a big band project that is coming, yes. but before we talk about that, let's go back to Love and Liberation, which was your album right. that, you know, got you that NAACP Image Award and how you were able to weave in, as you mentioned, culture, you were able to weave in to the music, what was happening in America at that point. So let's talk about that album. So Love and Liberation is kind of a sequel to A Social Call. You know, there was a method to my madness in that my first album, I wanted to sing mostly standards because I wanted the world to hear me singing standards. You know, of course, I write music, but I wanted to I wanted to have the standards be there so that I can say, OK, do you like this? Hear this sound. Listen to this. Do you remember this from the 40s, 50s and 60s? You know, do you remember this sound? But this is what it sounds like today. You know, let me put my spin on it. It's contemporary, but it's still sticking to the tradition. And people loved it, you know, and the album was really also bringing up a lot of I really wanted it to bring up the awareness of different things that we were experiencing, you know, a social call, not, Oh, let's go have a drink and be social. No, 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 no. Let's deal with what's happening in our society. Let's talk about xenophobia. Let's talk about racism. Let's talk about nuclear plants leaking into streams. Let's talk about all these things, you know, and if you don't know about them, let, let me just put it in a song. So maybe you can just hear it and then you can go do your own research. You know, that little small seed, that mustard seed, you know what I mean? Um, and so when they liked it, you know, and I found out that they liked it because of how my record company acted at the time. And also because of the Grammy nom, I was like, Grammy nom straight out the gate. All right, bet. So now I'm going to give you guys something. I'm going to go even deeper into what it is that I do. And I'm not going to include that many standards. Cause I'm going to see if you like what I write. Let me see how this, you know, how this will go. So, um, love Erica Badu wanted to, to pay homage to her by like um, re-encompassing one of her songs. So I kind of re-reincarnated something that she wrote, Green Eyes. Um, And because that story is my story too. You know, I've been insecure about myself and my life and who I am as a lover and as a woman, you know. Um, And so that I, you know, that, that hit me, that hit home for me, you know, many times, because when I was 12, it meant something completely different when I, than when I was 22 or 21. Right. Um, so I grew up on that. And then I wanted to pay homage to John Hendricks, the late Greg John Hendricks, you know, no more. I ain't gonna let nobody mess with my soul no more. That was then in 69, but this is now we're still 20 years, 30, 40, 50, 60 years later, dealing with the same stuff. Um, so same mashed potatoes warmed over. And then I wanted to give a little bit of my original compositions. There's when I say, um, which was something that one of my daughters said to me one day and I was like, Oh, you know, and it made me realize how sassy and how, um, how I am as a person, you know, having children, they are a reflection of you. So I wanted to pay homage to them too. Thank you for helping mommy write these songs, you know? Um, and then there's a song like, free your mind. I feel like there's so much going on in our society right now, you know, with the media and the social media and all these different things that are just being colors and sounds and vibrations that are being pierced into our thought process and our minds. 
Um, and I really just wanted to say, here's a little, here's another little seed, you know, let your thoughts expand, look to the promised land, you know, let's, let's move, let's progressively move forward and not sit here and deal with things and just hold it in. Let's be, let's do something therapeutic, like talking about it. Um, the name is love and liberation because they, they coexist together. You have to love yourself first. So now that we know about all these issues with the social call, let's go in, in with love by loving yourself first, because you can't love anybody else. If you don't have it to give your cup has to run it over before you can actually share that love with somebody else. But once you get the love, go ahead and liberate yourself. Be free in that. Express that. Share that. Find out what that means for you specifically as a, as one person. Find out what that means to you, that love and that liberation. And then live in those elements. Dwell in those elements. Um, so the album speaks to many different ways of love for a community, you know, for yourself, for your lover, for your partner, for your family. It's so many different aspects of love and liberation. Um, and it's a liberating experience. So yes <laughs> yeah absolutely. No, i i love it. and free your mind is one of is one of my favorites i mean whenever i hear that song it just it, it it you you move to it but then again you're i'm listening to what you're saying mm -hmm. and it's definitely what we need to hear right now in the midst of everything else that we're being bombarded with like you said the social media the stuff on the news we're reading it you know in the newspapers this will help you to like, like you said free your mind Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this big band project because um, when I when I heard that I was like, oh wow, that's that's huge. I am elated. I I don't I I don't want to share too much, but I am so excited. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, will these be new songs or will these be uh, jazz standards? Mostly new songs. But a few standards. I threw a few. I'm like, ah, uh, you know, I, I threw a few standards in there. And actually, some of them are not jazz standards, you know, in a sense that the Erica Badu song is not a jazz standard. But when you listen to my version of it, you're like, oh, I get it, you know. So I've done that same thing with with um, some songs from other composers or whose names I'm not going to say at the moment. Okay. Um, but it's it's big band and it's orchestral. So some songs have strings and some songs only have the big band um so in the history of jazz i'll be the first woman to write the songs actually i'll be the first person to write and sing most people just sang or wrote you know if you think about somebody like duke ellington or count basie they would just write they wouldn't actually um they wouldn't actually sing and then you have somebody like maria schneider she's not a singer but she's a great composer and a great musician so she's composed so many different songs and, and done a lot of arrangements, but I'll be the first person to actually write and produce and sing, because this is not something that I'm releasing with the record company either. This is my own project. I'm doing it all on my own. And so I decided to do a documentary to go with it um, because I am the first woman. So you'll get to see a little bit into my life and the process and what it's like for me as a mother, my motherhood, my musicianship, how I run my band, how I run my rehearsals, how I write my charts. Um, a lot, a lot about, about the process, you know, because people need to see the process. And then the important thing about that is, is during the COVID, you know, it's, it's been during, you know, COVID time. So it's not how I would actually usually get it done. It's, I've had to make I've had to make, you know, make do with what I have. Um, and that's very important. I really want to share my story now because there are a lot of women or a lot of people who have been through what I've been through, the traumatic experiences, as well as the great experiences. And I want to share that it's okay to claim when you are a victim, it's okay to claim that you have been victimized, but it's also great to walk in that victory. You don't have to hold that on your shoulders. You have to let that weight go. My grandfather used to always say to me, um, he used to tell me this story about the man with the bag, about the man with the bag or the sack. He would say, you ever heard about, about the man with the sack? And I'd say, no, granddad, because I was tired of hearing his stories, right? I'd be like, oh, no, dad, no, granddad. Um, but the man with the sack carried two sacks, actually. He carried one on his left shoulder that had a hole in the back. And he carried one on his right shoulder that he sat in the front and it was so small. 
but the one in the back was huge. And so every time he walked, he just walked along on his journey. And every time someone says something negative or ugly about him, he put it in that sack that was had a hole in it that was facing towards the back. And he, anytime someone said or he experienced something positive, he sat it right here on the front close to his heart so that he could keep those things close and safe by him. But those things that would weigh him down, the sack had a hole in it for a reason so that he could walk along on his journey and all that stuff just fall out behind him and he doesn't have to worry about it. You know, and when I was young, I probably was like 10 or 11. I was like, these stories are so stupid and annoying. Why does he always have these little dumb analogies? But those stories hit home. I'm telling you, those stories that our elders teach, you know, they come out of nowhere and they be so random, but they so easy and quick. You can get it. You know, it's not some esoteric or some, you know, super imposed theoretical thing. It's just. The man with the bag, two sacks, one in the back, one in the front, one with a hole. Keep it next to your heart. Boom. Keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? You can teach that to a child. And um, those stories have really, really helped me. So this album is about that, really. <laughs> it's about we, we've we had a social call. You know, we had the sequel, which is Love and Liberation. It's just a step forward, um, you know, and, and I can't also it's it's a working progress right now. We're going into the studio next week. So I'm not, I'm not going to tell you the title because when I finish recording, it might change. I may change it. Um, so I, I won't share that either, but just know that this project is about to be lit. It's about to be so amazing. I'm, I'm like, I'm stoked because I'm doing everything on my own and there's a lot of poetry involved as well. There's so much poetry. It won't be an album that's like, okay, this song has ended. Now we got to go into the next song. It's going to be like consistent moving movement each song bleeds into the next song it's a whole arc you know it's not just oh i put this song here and that song there Mm -mm. nobody's in control but me and the most high you know and and i'm producing it and everything so i don't there's no producer to say oh this doesn't sound right that doesn't uh uh-uh it's i'm i'm putting my all into it you know i'm putting my my everything into it so i'm excited I hope that this is new music that we're going to hear when you return to historic Piedmont Park this fall for the Atlanta yes. Jazz Festival. How excited yes. are you to be returning to Atlanta? Really excited. As a matter of fact, I'm coming in a couple of days early just so I can <laughs> just so I can eat some good food and hang out. I just I love Atlanta. And, um, you know, this is the first time that I'm actually going to have my children with me as well. So I'm going to take them to some museums and kind of, you know, sh- share and show them my favorite eating spots and things and kind of hang out. And I'll have Henry to guide me. Henry won't be playing this time, but I'll definitely have him and Russell Gunn and a couple of others to just say, oh, check this spot out. Check this spot out, you know, for me. So. Um, so, yeah, I'm 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 elated. I love Atlanta. Wow. Love it. And we love you too. I and, and make sure I'm there. I want to. I want to be there, even if, yes. even if we can just catch some coffee or, or something like that. Please. The title of this series is in the tradition, and so I wanted to ask you: Is there something that is traditional to Jasmine Horn? Is there something that you have done uh, that you still continue to do from the beginning of your your career until now? Hmm. Well, there's a couple of, there's a bunch of different things. Um, I write down a lot of my thought processes, you know, for projects, but not just projects in general. Like when I have something on my mind about the music industry, about life, whatever, I write it down. And then the same thing with my prayers. I always write them down so that I can be in gratitude for what I prayed for when it does come to pass. And then looking at all three of those things, my prayers, my future, and then my past, what I've written down, my thought process, it all, most of the time I'm manifesting because manifestation starts with a thought first. You have to think about what it is and then you have to visualize, you have to see what that is. And then you write it down and then you speak it into existence with the prayer. You're you're speaking it into existence. So that's like the kind of like the stamp. I've thought about it and then I've seen it and then I've written it down. So now it's not in my head anymore. It's actually on paper. It's written down. And then once I read it, I speak it when I'm reading. 
So I'm speaking it into existence. And then it out the next thing for it is to, is to just happen. So, you know, manifest success. That's been my tradition. Absolutely. Jasmine Horn, thank you so very much for being a part thank of you, In the Jasmine. Tradition. Again, she is returning to historic Piedmont Park this fall as part of the Atlanta Jazz Festival. And we cannot wait to see you. Much success with this new project. I'm excited. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm going to be checking out your, your IG page to see when all of that information drops. And again, we look so forward to seeing you perform this fall. Thank you so much, Ray. I'll see y'all soon.